Hi everyone, welcome back to another video talking about medicine in folklore, continuing our series on werewolves, this time talking about hypertrichosis. And this one's not going to be too complicated of a video, not a whole lot of mechanisms to go into, but kind of an interesting topic thinking about werewolves and how somebody could have more hair than expected. But in order to really talk about hypertrichosis, we need to talk about what normal hair growth looks like on a human. So there are a few different hair types that we're going to cover. The first one, um, if you've ever seen a newborn baby or a very young baby, um, you may have noticed that they're a little fuzzy. Uh, a lot of babies have a type of hair called lanugo, and some babies might have less than others, um, but this lanugo is a fine, soft hair that covers the entire newborn, including the face, the body, the hands, the neck, pretty much the entire baby could be covered in either a very dark hair or a very light hair, depending on the baby. Um, but this lanugo has a purpose of binding something called vernix while in the uterus. So vernix is a waxy substance. If you've seen a baby right after birth, it's covered in this kind of like yellow waxy substance, and that's vernix. And it functions to protect the baby while in utero, and lanugo just functions to help the vernix bind better to the baby. So it has a very important function, but you don't have lanugo for the rest of your life normally. Um, it is going to lead to something called vellus hair, the next type of hair we're going to cover, um, and this is peach fuzz. And in people who are younger or in people who are estrogen dominant, or if someone is testosterone dominant, but in certain areas of their body, um, such as like the front of your neck, um, certain uh, parts of your hands, your feet, those don't have as much uh, uh, androgen sensitivity, you'll get this peach fuzz. Uh, if you're estrogen dominant and, and notice this, the really short um, light hairs uh, on the face, this is vellus hair. And it's not very noticeable unless you take a really close look at it. So you might not even think that it's there, but trust me, everybody has vellus hair and it is totally normal. Um, and then the last type of hair we're going to cover is terminal hair. And this is the, the dark, thick hair um, that grows on most people's heads. And it also grows on the face of people who are androgen dominant uh, or in anybody uh, with more androgen sensitive regions. So like armpit hair, chest hair. Uh, pubic hair even are more sensitive to these hormone effects. So terminal hair is very noticeable when we think of hair growth. Um, that's that's normally what we're talking about. But each of these serve a purpose and they each last for a certain amount of time depending on your hormone influences uh, and your age. So the lanugo starts off and this is going to fall off and then be replaced by vellus hair. So you have this very dark, um, fine, soft hair on the baby um, that might be very noticeable. That's going to be replaced by the peach fuzz. That's not very noticeable. So it seems like you're not having hair anymore on your body when in fact you are. It's just smaller and lighter hair um, or certain parts of the body, such as the top of the head, um, might just become terminal hair right away without going through the vellus stage. Sometimes other areas, such as the face, uh, you'd go from lanugo to vellus hair in childhood, and then adding terminal hair onto it later on uh, in adolescence and adulthood. So this is the normal progression, right? But everything has exceptions. So what happens if this pattern does not follow in this way? And this is where we get hypertrichosis. So... Hypertrichosis lanuginosa, also known as werewolf disease. And we see this all throughout history. There are royal families even that have been known to have werewolf disease uh, where they've had hair on their face, on their hands, on their arms, um, places where you wouldn't expect hair to grow. And there are a few causes for this, um, but the main underlying mechanism is that lanugo is not replaced by vellus hair, and the lanugo persists. So, like I mentioned previously, if this lanugo is very noticeable, fuzzy hair, and it should be replaced by not noticeable hair, if you don't replace it 
and you keep having the Lanugo, it's probably very noticeable and it's going to show up on places you don't want it to be. So this is where you're getting the hair on your face and on your neck and on your hands, making you look almost like a werewolf um, because you have this Lanugo that is not falling off, not being replaced. So there are a few ways that this can happen. Probably the most uh, notable, or most recognizable is congenital hypertrichosis lanuginosa. And so this would be somebody who had lanugo as a, a baby and then it just never switched. So they would be classified as a werewolf from birth. And this could also present with gingival hyperplasia or uh, increased growth of the gums which could, and this is speculation here, but this could also add on to the werewolf myth because it could cause the teeth to look like they're in an unusual shape. Um, so that's not super important, and you don't always get gingival hyperplasia with hypertrichosis lanuginosa, but it's there. It might be a contributing factor. Um, so the, the mechanism for the congenital form of this is not really well understood, um, some cases have been reported that kind of show an X-linked pattern within families. Um, some also show uh, a possible microdeletion in ABCA5 or ABCA5 gene on, the, on chromosome 17. And uh, it could also be related to adrenal activity because there have been some cases of hypertrichosis where the patient happened to undergo an adrenal ablation and that seemed to resolve some of it. Um, but we, we don't really know. Those are kind of the leading hypotheses at this point. Um, but the idea is that these people don't have a way to be treated. This is incurable. Uh, they could attempt to do something like electrolysis or they could shave but there's nothing that could undo this condition. So someone who's born uh, with congenital hypertrichosis lanuginosa, they have lanugo, uh, they're probably going to be bullied for a lot of their life, especially in a society that doesn't understand what this is. You have someone with hair that looks almost animal-like. It could very easily lead to stigma and lead to... Um, not fitting in socially. It, it could be a problem for somebody and could lead to um, some persecution from religious organizations who think that this is related to some satanic activity. So the next mechanism, which actually would be a lot more common because this congenital type is very, very uncommon, but the next type, especially knowing... Uh, the lack of medical care back in these days when, when werewolves and lycanthropy were a worry is malignancy. Um, people who have certain adenocarcinomas of the bowel, of the breast, of the lung, and of the kidney, um, they can get hypertrichosis. Not exactly sure, again, about the mechanism of why adenocarcinomas of these specific areas may cause this, but this is uh, what we call a paraneoplastic syndrome. So it's not something necessarily, uh, it's not a direct cause uh, from the cancer, but if, if the cancer produces certain hormones that might cause uh, this to grow or certain mutations that are also associated, um, then you could get hypertrichosis with this malignancy. And the nice part, at least about this, is that the hypertrichosis tends to regress when you excise a tumor or when um, you undergo radiation or chemo, depending on the type of tumor you have. Um, but you could get rid of this side effect with um, elimination or eradication of this tumor. Uh, in comparison to congenital, where it, there's no cure for it, you just got to live with it. Although, really thinking about this, um, if you have adenocarcinoma of your lungs, uh, you probably... I mean, the hypertrichosis is probably the least of your worries at this point because this is a pretty scary cancer. Um, but in this, those days when you had um, smoking, you had a lot of alcohol, um, not a lot of understanding about medical science, of course, malignancy would have been very common and would have been very fatal. So this is a potentially more common cause of 
uh, werewolves back in those times, even compared with the congenital. And then the last one, something that we have talked about in the past before, Porphyria cutanea tarda. And go back and watch my video on this. This was in the Vampire series uh, because this is about the heme synthesis mechanism. And as I mentioned in that video, it can be acquired from liver disease or congenital. And this is caused by a mutation in urod. So go back and watch that video if you want more information on Porphyria cutanea tarda. Since I did that already, I'm not going to cover that in a lot of detail here. But Understanding this mechanism can really help us once again understand why going about this in a religious way, uh, using intuition to think about disease and think about what we would think of as demonic might not actually be that. Maybe understanding the science is important and really can help us better interact with people and better treat humans like humans and not stigmatizing certain diseases that are not in their control. So... I hope you liked this video. I hope you are enjoying this series on medicine and folklore, and I will see you all in the next one.